Good afternoon uh, in uh, Kampala. Good morning to uh, Professor Meister in uh, San Francisco. Um, I think it's only 8 a.m. there. Um, well, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome Professor Robert Meister, a best known uh, advisor for his book, uh, After Evil, uh, which I think has been read by uh, uh, most students in the second, third, fourth, fifth years. Um, and uh, welcome to uh, the two discussants. The first discussant will be uh, Adventino Banjwa. Adventino is a third year student uh, at Miser writing his comprehensive exams. And uh, the second discussant will be Professor Tom Mitchell. Uh, all, of, all of us on this platform have uh, heard uh, Professor Mitchell uh, just a couple of months ago. Uh, Professor Mitchell also very well known at uh, Miser for his book, for his latest book, Carbon Democracy. Uh, Professor Meister will uh, will speak for between forty five minutes uh, and an, and an hour uh, on the contemporary, urgent, important issue of democratizing finance. Uh, we will give between ten and twelve minutes. Uh, to uh, Adventino Banjua and up to 15 minutes to uh, uh, Professor Mitchell. Um, then Professor Maestro will respond and we will have a series of engagements with three comments and a response by the speaker and so on. Welcome, Professor Bob Meister. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for waiting for me to wake up. I'd rather wait in the day for you. Uh, but uh, now I've had a shower and I'm feeling like talking. Okay, uh, you want me to start? Yes, please. Okay. I gave Mamu two chapters from my forthcoming book, Justice is an Op. And uh, for purposes of today, I chose the least technical chapter so you can see what the political stakes of my argument might be, and the most technical chapter, so I don't have to try to explain it to you over Zoom. This book is a, a sequel to my previous book, After Evil, which I believe that uh, many of you at Miser may have read. I certainly enjoyed discussing it when I was there some years back. And in After Evil, I criticized the idea that uh, what comes after a history of cumulative injustice today is not a revolution. A revolution would be a bad thing because uh, uh, victorious victims would have victims. The view is rather that what comes after a history of cumulative injustice is rather a cultural shift to a humanitarian discourse a discourse in which the beneficiaries of past evil largely get to keep their cumulative gains in return for acknowledging that past injustice really matters to them, so that what they do is they offer a moral consensus, they share in a moral consensus, that the past is evil, is evil. in return for imposing uh, or creating a political consensus that the evil is past. My argument is that in the humanitarian discourse, beneficiaries get to keep their gains and even to compound their gains, thereby appearing to perpetuate the past, the historical injustice, and that the historical victims in turn get to but only in return for permanently deferring the project of reversing or better yet harvesting the cumulative effects of past injustice so that all that bad history 
will not have been a waste. Now, the implicit assumption behind that book, After Evil, is that history does not consist of what may have been originary wrongs that are then followed by a, a great run of good luck uh, in which the advantages arising from those originary wrongs become cumulative. No, I say, the likelihood of these cumulative effects is a reason for the originary wrongdoing, and the occurrence of these cumulative effects, originary wrongdoing, even worse in retrospect. And yet, I'm sorry to say that the cumulative wrong in history, the role of accumulation, and specifically the role of accumulation in the history of capitalism, has been largely ignored by my fellow political theorists who are concerned with justice. That is to say, it's been ignored except around the question of luck and whether or not luck is morally neutral. It was ignored, that is, until after evil, which has also been largely ignored by my fellow political theorists. So I'm afraid to say it's still ignored. Now this book, is a sequel to After Evil. It argues that what comes after a history of cumulative injustice, which is more than an originary wrong followed by great good luck, is not what I criticize as human rights discourse. No, what comes after a history of cumulative injustice should rather be a form of historical justice. A form of historical justice, which, if it's not revolutionary, <laughs> is nevertheless a form of historical justice in which revolution remains what I call an option, an option in the colloquial sense that it's a possibility that can't be ruled out in advance, but also an option in the technical sense that options can be valued in the present, even when they cannot be exercised in the present. So that the value of revolutionary justice as an option, the point of saying that it's an option, is that it has a present value in a technical sense, even when revolution is not on the table. My project in Justice is an Option, then, is to gain access for the purpose of historical justice to the very thing that human rights discourse left in place, the thing that I criticize it for leaving in place, which is the cumulative value of past injustice as it affects present socioeconomic gaps. And my method in justice is an option is to make this cumulative justice politically actionable, politically available for action, by using the theory of options pricing that has been developed in modern financial practice and in modern financial writing over the past 50 years, the 50 years uh, in which uh, I'm afraid to say my academic uh, career has gone on. So this is a way of closing out, it's a way of coming to terms, it's a way of capturing what one underneath all of the work that I and, 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 and uh, certainly Mahmoud and Tim and many others have been trying to do uh, to keep something like the Marxist project alive. What I am here trying to do is to use the theory of options pricing critically in much the way that Marx used the theory of commodity pricing that arose in the political economy of the 50 years preceding him in order to access the fruits of surplus value accumulation, because the fruits of surplus value are far, far greater cumulatively, as it were, plus value production work in the first place. Okay? So my thesis is that historical justice is itself an option on the accumulated value of capital. The accumulated value of capital is, of course, what gets wiped out in moments of revolution. 
It gets wiped out at any moment, that is, when the, cum the, when the cumulative value of capital can't be cashed. And this is what happens when the capital market itself, when the capital market, is, is it, somebody says they can't hear me. Are, are, is, my, is my audio coming in? Um, someone cannot hear your audio. Uh, Javi, can you please attend to Gizal Al Al? That's okay. Bob, you can continue. I can continue? Okay. Yeah. I just, it's only one person. It's only one person. Okay. I just didn't. Uh, yeah. Okay. So essentially, revolutionary justice is what happens when the value of cumulative wealth, at least cumulative wealth held in the form of financial instruments, reduces to zero because there are no capital markets. And my thesis in this book is that the present value of the option of revolutionary justice is the political price that can be extracted for keeping cumulative wealth in place by not having a revolution. In other words, it's the price of the rollover of the revolutionary option. Uh, and the rollover of the revolutionary option is what it takes to keep the accumulated value of wealth, to use the technical term in finance, liquid, which is what is known in finance as the liquidity premium. And in finance, the price of a liquidity premium can not only be affected by political upheaval, everyone knows that. My argument in the book is that it's a price that can also be extracted by political upheaval. That is to say, the financial liquidity of accumulated capital is what Tim Mitchell would call a political choke point in today's financialized capitalism. And affecting the financial liquidity of accumulated capital is the counter strategy for the strategy that capital uses to suppress labor, which is largely the strategy of threatening a capital strike. We're threatening a capital strike. In other words, capitalists threatening to destroy themselves rather than share what they have uh, is indeed the way in which today a austerity politics, for example, is imposed on uh, people at precisely those moments when social justice should be and would otherwise be worth more. Of this can be understood in terms of the overarching question of the historical injustice of capitalism itself, which is really whether and how and to what extent the present beneficiaries of past injustice not only keep their cumulative gains, but get to compound those gains, and whether and how and to what extent those cumulatively disadvantaged by historical injustice can benefit from it so that, as I just said a moment ago, all that bad history will not have been a waste. Now, historical justice, as I conceive it, requires eliminating the benefits of past injustice that persist and compound under capitalism and potentially harvesting them. But there is a political conundrum posed if you try to simply transpose a Marxist analysis of capitalist industrialization, which focuses on, on ownership means of value production, straightforwardly into a Marxist analysis of capitalist financialization, which focuses on ownership and control of the means of value preservation and accumulation. Why is there a conundrum? Well, because if wealth consists of investments in machinery and in raw materials, these can be seized uh, by uh, workers, for example. And if they are as means of production, even if they lose their role as vehicles of capital accumulation. But when wealth is held in financial form, it isn't possible in any straightforward way to nationalize and cumulative effects of that wealth, 
without making the capital markets that hold that wealth or in which that wealth is valued and traded illiquid and making capital markets illiquid reduction of the wealth accumulated in those markets to zero meaning that if you try to seize that wealth there would technically be no wealth to seize this very conundrum has as centralized, and I hope I hope to uh, to cure that paralysis in my book, the project of a socialist revolution against financialized capitalism by making it almost inconceivable, insofar as the wealth that is held in financial form here, if it were not held by the people who now hold it. So, my solution in this book is not to uh, pretend that this isn't a conundrum not to wish it away, but rather to embrace. I thus claim in the book that financial capitalism's inability to conceive of historical justice, except as something that lies beyond it, is also an important, at least something that, and functions within it as the implicit and often invisible link between capital markets and state power that I am trying in this book to make more visible. By this I mean that the link becomes invisible to the extent that losing cap confidence in the future liquidity of themselves, in the future liquidity of capital markets, is the very thing that capital markets threaten to do whenever there arise demands such as we're seeing in my country this very week to reverse the cumulative effects of past injustice so that whatever we do at the level of making these demands simply you know kind of prefigurative consciousness of, of some of some post-racial or uh, racialized or post-capitalist future Whatever we do is ultimately constrained by the threats of what I call the suicide bombers on Wall Street and in other financial centers to blow themselves up along with the entire economy if the public fails to recognize that it has no choice but to give them everything they think they need to preserve the liquidity of capital markets on which we all depend. Now, this exercise of power by capital, whether it's explicit has meant that Marxist politics as, as currently understood, and it's currently understood to be largely limited to the sphere of production, essentially fails in one important respect. It fails the political role of capital within capitalism. Specifically, the political role of capital and of the capital markets in the process of value preservation and accumulation is that process that compounds the effects of historical justice by turning them into cumulative advantages where actually the fact that historical justice creates cumulative advantages is what is ultimately wrong with bad and is also in important ways a reason why bad history occurs namely that it does produce advantages that are cumulative. So my book addresses this problem directly by reading, as Marx read the foremost political economists of his day, by reading the foremost writers on the topic of financial macroeconomics, on the topic of the relation of state and capital market. My own time, and by recognizing that these writers on the field of financial macroeconomics are largely concerned with what the state can do what does to maintain the liquidity of capital markets. So the concept of liquidity on which I've been publishing for the past uh, 10 years, I talked about it uh, uh, the last time I was in, in, in at Miser, uh, and, and very much enjoyed those conversations. Liquidity is crucially important to my argument because unless surplus value can be preserved in a form that is liquid, 
as a financial asset that is convertible into money without being money so that capital be preserved without having to hoard money, there will be little possibility, little point in producing an additional surplus. In other words, the fact that accumulated wealth is held in the form of things that become worthless when they become illiquid is not a source of weakness in capitalism per se. It is the source of the power that capitalists exercise, which is essentially the power to act as suicide bombers who can destroy their wealth, their own wealth, rather than, rather than sharing in it. Now, does this mean that Marxists would say that it does mean that the wealth that is held in this form, the we wealth that is held in a form in which its existence depends upon its liquidity, is therefore fictitious. Fictitious in the sense that Marx understood that it doesn't add to real wealth. It doesn't add to real wealth in the sense that if you have a house and a mortgage on the house, you don't have twice as much wealth as you would have uh, if you just had the house. You don't have as much wealth as you would have if you had a second house. The mortgage is fictitious in the sense that it's just a way of redescribing the original wealth. It's not fictitious in the sense that Marx meant be, that it's not worth seizing because its nominal value is purely an artifact of the social power of the present holder of that wealth and would not survive the end of that social power. Uh, it's not fictitious in the sense uh, that its distribution is zero sum. Uh, that is to say that it's like, it's, 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 it's just, it's just, there used to be a card game when I was a kid called Old Maid in which there was one bad card and somebody has to hold it. No, it's not that. It's not that, and this is important because while there are purely speculative assets that fit the description that I just gave. It's also true, and this is, this is what I get from options theory, that an asset that adds liquidity or optionality to an existing portfolio really does increase the value of that portfolio because it adds an element of optionality. For example, if I buy something, let's say a car for a price, we'll exchange liquidity, money, for a car that is at that moment worth that price, but is less liquid, partly because its price, well, it's likely to go down, but its price is certainly not going to be stable. In other words, I, I exchange liquidity for risk. But the result of this is, and I think, I think you'll see it, what happens when I exchange liquidity for a car which is less liquid than the money doesn't mean that I have, well, a portfolio consisting of the car which is worth exactly that amount of money. Giving up the money for the car exposes me to the risk that its price will go down, as well as, of course, the benefit of letting it go up. The point of financial theory, the point of options theory, is that in addition to exchanging liquidity for risk, both up and down risk, you could have the car plus liquidity but you would have to pay extra for it. In other words, you could buy the car and buy an option to resell the car at the original price if the price doesn't go higher, in which case you would have a portfolio consisting of a car plus the option that locks in its future price, that hedges you against a fall in its price, 
and a portfolio consisting of a car plus an option is worth more than a portfolio consisting of only a car. In other words, the provision of liquidity, the guarantee of liquidity adds value. In other words, and this is an important part of chapters in the book that I didn't give you, in addition to the commodity form being the kernel of value production, the option form, which is essentially a hedge that locks in value as the right to resell the car back for its original price would lock in the value of the car. A hedge is the kernel of, 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 of value accumulation. And thus, and thus, which a financial market adds to an underlying commodity market. By creating a market in hedges, by creating a market in options, is an important part of the theory of justice in capitalism, the theory of value that allows value to be preserved, that allows value that is preserved to become cumulative, to compound, and that is largely uh, uh, largely uh, uh, left out, both in uh, the field of uh, political theory, uh, in which I uh, uh, have some 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 uh, marginal role, but also in the field of Marxist theory, in which I also, because my focus is on accumulation, uh, my role is marginal. So my book restates Marx the relation of two ideas that are equally central to capitalism. The first, which is very clearly uh, uh, expressed in Marx's own work, is that capital capitalism, well, creates value. And that in creating value, capitalism supports life. It supports life by providing both employment and wages and by the means of subsistence that can be purchased by means of wages so, so that the genome as marx explains is that it is the simultaneous solution to the problems of production and consumption that uh, both production and consumption until it doesn't in which case you get overproduction underconsumption and what Marx called the realization problem, which is to say that you have not produced the demand uh, uh, for which you have produced the supply, as it were. Now, in addition to creating value or supporting life, the other side of capitalism, the side uh, that I, I stress as a, a supplement to Marx, is that capitalism creates liquidity. It supports, it supports markets, for example, by being able to price the market risk of overproduction. So that just as you can buy an option in my hypothetical example, locking in the price of your car by giving you a right to resell it back at the original price, you have the car plus liquidity, the liquidity adds value to your portfolio. So you could, in Marx's theory, and this is something that Marx uh, couldn't have understood, purchase a guarantee against, for example, the realization problem. Uh, and, 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 and you could do this only assuming that such guarantees can themselves be bought and sold as part of a separate financial market so that they really are separate assets. They really are separate assets so that just as the genius of capitalism is to provide a simultaneous solution to the problem of production and consumption so that both can increase in tandem, capitalist financialization provides a simultaneous solution to the problem of risk and security, of risk and security. And this is, I think, where the, uh, the missing political chapters in volumes two and three uh, in volume three, where, 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 where the manuscript breaks off, uh, would have to go, namely uh, that, 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 that politics and the political dimension of capitalism 
is 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 how you act on uh, the relationship of risk and security that are primarily expressed in the financial markets uh, uh, when the financial markets basically allow you allow you to convert uh, an asset to use assets to generate funds to meet the discipline of payments as in my example of the car. If you have the option to sell the car back at its original price, you can always use the car to get that money back. Well, converting an asset into funds that satisfy the discipline of payments is the political precondition, the condition of accumulation on which the market mode of production is based. And this means that, as I just mentioned, Marx's problem can be hedged, and a hedge form needs to be understood alongside the value form as a kernel of value preservation. So this is the Marxian foundation of my argument, and the time has now come to articulate it more fully. Uh, my argument is about the relationship between value and liquidity, and and about the, the, the techno-social uh, conjuncture in which we now see the relationship between value and liquidity in its institutional concreteness in crises such as the crisis of 2008 and, of course, the crisis that we are uh, uh, experiencing. And this is why I'm so glad that, uh, that Tim Mitchell has agreed uh, to uh, respond to my paper, because I'm drawing here on his work. Tim describes the techno-social solutions of the 19th century as creating choke points that are openings, and this is what he means by calling them choke points, openings for politicizing what appears to be merely a technology. According to Tim, the choke points of 19th century industrial capitalism are that, well, uh, a, it's vulnerable at the coalface. It's vulnerable at the coalface because, as I said in the chapter uh, I gave you, which is just quoting what Tim said, basically, uh, horizontal coordination among miners can defeat uh, vertical coordination between the miners and their managers and, and that ability of a general uh, if, 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 if rail workers support the coal miners uh, and if steel workers support the rail workers uh, and raises the possibility then of repression of the general strike uh, so that the value chain between coal and rail and steel and so forth is continued. So you, what you need is, in other words, to think about this as, as both micro-political at the, the ability of the miners and the rail workers to sabotage capitalism and macro-political, you have to uh, address at the national level the question of whether the military will be sent down the mine shafts uh, to break the strike. Well, in my view, the choke points of 21st century capitalism, which is financial, are financial. In other words, a liquidity crisis uh, that cuts off the chain of payments and that allows capitalism to produce the liquidity that generates funds would result in a disaccumulation of wealth held in the form of financial assets. Uh, and uh, thus the question becomes how you begin to coordinate the micro-political uh, way of, uh, of, of addressing this at the level of, 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 of popular uh, uprising uh, that takes advantage of the techno-social uh, uh, possibilities of disrupting capitalism, uh, how you articulate this in relation to the macro-political uh, dimension of how it is that the state can uh, restore the liquidity and the security of capital markets so that once again, uh, the issue is both liquidity and security, which is where the political dimension comes in. So my view is that 
again, we are talking, as we were at the moment of general strike, about the possibility of revolution leading to disaccumulation, that is to say, the wipeout of accumulated wealth. But we're also talking about the way in which the option of a general strike or the option of a liquidity crisis can be rolled over for a price that becomes higher, that becomes higher the more the process of accumulation is itself threatened. So that, that for example, the win over the revolutionary option of a general strike could be considered to have been, as I say in my book, the welfare state, which in some uh, European industrial societies uh, consumed uh, 30 to 40 percent of GDP uh, in the Scandinavian countries. So I am arguing that historical justice in financialized capitalism has a present value and that that value can and extracted now to fund movements demanding historical justice at the expense of the beneficiaries of past injustice. I am arguing in my book that the macroeconomic liquidity premium that preserves the value of accumulated wealth, wealth accumulated in financial form, does go up and go up exponentially with political turbulence, and that it has a value identical with the political premium that democracy can extract at those very moments the democracy can extract for rolling over or renewing historical justice as the option of letting it all go down the drain. And that, of course, of course, uh, these are the very moments in which, because, because justice is worth the most at these moments, capitalists threaten to crash the economy and impose us to doing so. In other words, it is because these are the moments when justice is worth most that austerity is demanded of the movements that would otherwise demand that justice. Hmm? So, I was at McCrary at Miser during the first half of the decade that I've spent working on this project. And at that time, I don't know how many of you were, th were there then, I did a lot of hand waving on this topic. I pointed out, for example, that in 2008, the US GDP was worth 13 trillion, but the uh, total credit market debt in the economy was, uh, the US economy was around 76 trillion, which was four or five times, as I recall. I haven't recalculated it, GDP. And that total credit market debt, net of the federal component, which was the amount that was already guaranteed, uh, was really that at that point a little trillion. And that what the US government had done in 2008 was essentially to guarantee or preserve the liquidity of that 60 trillion by doing what I just talked about with the car by essentially offering to swap it or buy it back for US government debt at par value at 60 trillion. So I asked, what would the premium on a put option guaranteeing 60 trillion have been worth at that time? And I also asked if that's a question, why shouldn't financial macroeconomics be able to answer it using the same techniques that they would use to price a liquidity put on a car, in my hypothetical example, to have the car plus liquidity. So you would have, say, a non-government private sector uh, uh, credit market debt, plus a guarantee on that debt. And I said, well, the price of that guarantee, particularly at that moment, would have been huge. And I estimated that it would have been much higher than the annual US government budget because it would be guaranteeing at least 60 trillion in value and that it would be closer, uh, if, not, if not equal to the value of the entire US government tax base. That is to say, US GDP net of government spending 
which would be around about $9 trillion. But far be it from me to figure this out, where are these financial macroeconomists who could tell us he's so silent after uh, 2008 out of the field. And I wasn't seeing it, and I certainly wasn't seeing literature uh, that was exposing the scandal uh, to which I was uh, pointing when I came to McCrary. But my dumb luck around 2017 about this, really, was to have discovered these guys and have discovered that they weren't silent and that they were writing simply in a literature that I didn't read, which was the literature on macrofinancial risk assessment and pricing. And the chapter that I gave you really reports my discovery of their arguments. Now, because I'm talking about the arguments of other people, that chapter is not typical of the rest of the book where I mostly present my own arguments. But it also casts the rest of the book as a political reading of what it is they are already saying, which adds a lot of credibility to my politics, I think. Because what they are saying really is that this is a liquidity premium, that the government did not charge, and that it could have because it was a liability, it was a guarantee that it was providing, it could have booked as an asset. It could have enriched itself by booking it as an asset. The implication is that in not doing that, it subsidized capital. But the other side of that implication is that it could have preserved capital without the subsidy because the, cal the, the premium was calculated as what capital would normally pay to preserve the value of an asset without a subsidy. So, this is the foundation in my book. It's the pivotal chapter, which is why I gave it to you, although it's the most difficult chapter. It's the pivotal chapter for equating the liquidity premium that they calculated to the price that democracy can or could have extracted for rolling over historical justice as an option, and especially the price that it could have extracted when the value of historical justice as an option is high, and when it could be made higher through insurgent political action, even if a revolution is hard. So what I discovered and reported in this chapter five is that three Nobel Prize winning economists, writing with co-authors who included the likes of Mario Draghi, uh, the uh, governor director of the European Central Bank, the senior officials of the IMF and the World Bank and so on and so forth, all of whom supported the bailout, calculated, and here was the dumb luck, calculated the value of the liquidity guarantee that to global capital markets in 2008 as something between 9 trillion and 13 trillion, depending upon how much you guaranteed and how much you think was implicitly guaranteed. And then argued that this was a real liability of government that could and should have been paid for by creating a real asset on the part of government. For example, a call with the identical premium that would allow a state that could have been controlled by justice seeking subjects, it's not, and I'll get to that point in a minute, to harvest a major portion of the accumulated value of capital markets when they recovered and when uh, they recovered from the shock that they themselves caused. Now, what is the relevance of this today when the financial shock was not necessarily caused by factors endogenous to the capital markets? We have a coronavirus, which has not yet been shown to be of political origin. Well, what can threaten liquidity is any shock. It can be the shock of a pandemic. But the point is that any shock, whether it's an earthquake or a virus, will also be a financial shock in the sense that it will call for the state to do something to restore the confidence that capital markets have in their own liquidity, or in other words, to buy off the threat that the suicide bombers in those markets will blow themselves 
goes up, it costs usually is a, a, an initiative on the part of the state that uh, what it's doing is uh, is only even more and indeed to do as Mario Draghi said, whatever it takes to keep the capital markets from collapsing. So my point is that any shock, no matter what the origin, will be a liquidity crisis and thus a financial shock. And that much is accepted by all the guys I'm writing about in chapter five. What I add in the rest of my book is that any shock that is financial in this sense, whatever its origin, will also be political in my sense is that it will foreground the effect of compounding past injustice rather than offsetting injustice on the injustices that have already been compounded by the process of capital accumulation. And that this will then trigger what is happening now to make the capital markets liquid is making the injustices that have happened in the past even worse, even worse. Now, what I just said is I think a reasonable summary of the last week's news in my country. have relevance to whatever is happening wherever you are at the moment, uh, maybe even in Kampala. But it's my point to which I said I would return. It's relevant in part because while the U.S. state could have enriched itself by actually charging the liquidity premium at nine to twelve trillion dollars, as for example a claim on the accumulated wealth that was restored as a result of the actions of the government. Uh, I hope I won't shock you by saying that the U.S. is not a state controlled by justice-seeking subjects and that it is not primate. It's a state that is controlled by the beneficiaries of past injustice. So merely showing that it could have been written at the expense of capitalists doesn't historical justice if all that the state would do if it were thus enriched was to find some way of subsidizing the capitalists to control it, which is pretty much exactly what it did anyway in 2008. So the problem that I identify in this book is not merely how to enrich a state that could fund greater justice, it's also and simultaneously how to strengthen the forces and movements within such a state that would fund greater justice. That would fund greater justice. And how, in a sense, they can, and this is why, 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 why uh, macro political, uh, micro political analysis uh, is, uh, is so fruitful here that could fund themselves uh, through the very activities that also raise the value of the liquidity premium that I am discussing. In other words, part of the point of the book is not merely to say what I said in chapter five, the rest of the book is what movements that raise the value of the political liquidity uh, of the liquidity premium do when what they do really is to heighten the ability of capitalism to pre-visualize its own self-destructive tendencies and thus heighten the need of capitalism to try to find ways of hedging against its own self-destructive tendencies in other words what I am trying to say is that capitalism's apparent resiliency during the, uh, uh, if I were in graduate school, we have tried to, uh, to challenge it in our own modest ways, is largely that it is able, its source of immunity is that it's able to short itself. It's able to benefit from the turbulence that we create by creating financial value out of its ability to pre-visualize its own destruction. That this is its immune system. 
and 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 you know obviously there's some uh, more salient to me in the past uh, three months what i am trying to do is to say that at the horizontal level at the micro political level movements that raise the politically can benefit themselves indeed can finance themselves can fund themselves by creating what might be regarded as an autoimmune response to capitalism's own capacity to be resilient to against political upheaval by taking a short position on the possibilities that social movements allow it to to previsualize so that the anti-capitalist uh, politics that I does consist in self-consciously triggering an autoimmune response to capitalism that recognizes and leverages capitalism's propensity and need to short itself at moments of shock, as Naomi Klein describes in her book, The Shock Doctrine, when capitalism tends to embrace its own historical injustice by demanding austerity from its subjects in order to survive while at the same time hedging against the threat that what it's doing won't work and that indeed the markets will collapse. So this is, I think, a starting point for thinking about how justice-seeking subjects can effectively engage the insecurities of a non-justice granting state that they also aim to threaten. Because what drives financial capitalism, I believe, is a dynamic tension, a dynamic tension between what affects our sense of the possible and what affects our beliefs about the probable. And here, at a philosophical and at a cultural level, again, I, I derive lessons from my 10 years deep dive into the, the literature on finance. Because the underlying trope of finance, as I now read it, is, is quite simply that finance is about the heightened ability to imagine the threats that are possible makes capital increasingly uncertain about what's probable, about whether the future will be like the past, and provides capitalism with a way at the same time of profiting from, of benefiting from, of being resilient to its loss of confidence that past probabilities are wrong by allowing people to manufacture hedges against the possibility that it's not. So then in my view, the apparent resiliency version of capitalism is based on its ability to benefit from well, the volatility created by anti-capitalist or non-capitalist movements that make its continuation, that make its future survival seem contingent on politics by suggesting that alternatives can be visualized as possible and that visualizing them as possible is enough to shake your confidence that the survival of capitalism continues as it does to be probable. Where I differ, I think, from the people I read is that most of them think that what alternative anti-capitalist movements demonstrate are indeed possibilities, but that those possibilities are all bad. Uh, after 10 years of studying financialization, I want to argue that what is really revealed here is a fundamental link between illiquidity and insecurity. And that what capitalism has succeeded in doing, in a sense, the source of its power, is capitalism's political insecurity. 
as a way of creating or increasing the value of financial products that make capital markets liquid in the face of that insecurity. My argument is that both liquidity and security are political, that they are in fact the site of politics uh, in a straightforward sense, that they are contingent on choices made by government under threat, and that both liquidity and, and security politicized in ways that foreground historical justice. Uh, how am I doing on time, Mahmoud? Oh, you're fine. You, you have a, another 15 minutes if you want. Oh, okay. I don't need that much. Well, that's my argument today. That is to say, that's my argument about the present conjuncture. And it takes my cue from Tim Mitchell's argument about the techno-social possibilities and the techno-social vulnerabilities of 19th century and industrial capital. He knows my initial essay on this subject was about his book, uh, Carbon Democracy. The micro-political dimension in that book is that you can sabotage the system with the coalface. The macro-political dimension of that book is that you need a democratic majority to legitimate doing this, otherwise it's just sabotage, and that you need to legitimate doing this by problematizing the injustice of sending soldiers down the mine shafts or onto trains or into factories to smash legal strike, you problematize that injustice by showing that this is not the first experience of repression, by showing that precisely this is part of a pattern that has been going on, a part of a practice that has been going on perhaps for centuries, certainly for decades, which is what is being said on the streets of my country today. For me, the macro political dimension is to dramatize and politicize the public provision of financial bailouts of the financial system that preserve the cumulative effects of past injustice and to ask how is this okay and what would it take to reclaim the benefits that are created uh, through the reproduction and extension of that injustice and thus potentially what it would take to redeem the historical value of all that suffering. The micro-political dimension is that movements can be built and yes indeed they can even be funded by learning to benefit as capitalists already do from the turbulence and volatility that those movements create. So my micro-political claim is that a long short, short arbitrage on capitalism's future is already happening. For example, when hedge funds and bankers look at the uh, student debt movement, the strike student debt movement of which I was a part uh, 10 years ago and say, oh, well, uh, their success is being exaggerated. We can write derivatives, we can create financial securities that are hedging against the possibility uh, that, their, that, their, that their strength is being exaggerated because, because declining people's willingness to repay their debts may be offset by an increase in people's ability to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, 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 to repay their debts. And so, and so, uh, there are opportunities to, uh, uh, to create uh, derivatives, to create spreads uh, on, the, uh, on, on, on the volatility uh, in the market and student debt. Well, yes, yes, indeed. As I said at the time uh, when I was consulting with the movement, the movement could not succeed without making the market and student debt more volatile. Its tactic was to make the market in student debt more volatile, but it lacked a way from to benefit from or to build upon. It's the volatility of the student debt market, and thus capital was resilient to their activities or to our activities, precisely because capitalism understood how to benefit from them in a way that they did not. The tactical political question is thus whether oppositional social movements can produce as byproducts financial assets that capitalists would have to buy, would need to buy as hedges against the anxieties or uncertainties that these movements themselves aim to create and whether this can be done in a way that advances rather than sells out 
the pursuit of historical justice itself. In other words, what I am trying to do is ultimately show how capitalism, the possibility of new justice seeking subjects who can harvest some of the benefits of the illiquidity fears that they induce, even when those fears are exaggerated. I'm thus trying to add to the question of Marx and Engels, does capitalism give birth to its grave diggers by asking whether capitalism can be made to finance, to fund its grave diggers by leveraging the autoimmune process through which it has thus far become resilient through its ability to short itself. The last two substantive chapters of my book are then called Can Capitalism Short Itself and Funding Justice? And my point in those chapters is to say that historical justice is an option. The rhetorical sense that I want to counter austerity politics that essentially say in times of crisis, it's no longer an option, it's off the table. As Margaret Thatcher said, there is no alternative to austerity. But my point is also technical. I want to argue that there's a, that there is a point in using options theory itself to talk about historical justice. If the price of historical justice can be determined even when historical justice can't yet be achieved. I think options theory is at the very least a way of setting the price of something unknowable by putting it at par with something that is known and can be priced. So my use of options theory in chapter five is to essentially of that kind. I want to create a par between the present value of revolutionary justice, which is an option that has value even if it can't be exercised, the option of disaccumulation, to the present value of the option of preserving capital market liquidity, which is also an event of disaccumulation. And to say these two are the same, to say these two, in other words, of chapter five, is that the premium for maintaining the liquidity of accumulated wealth is identical with the premium that a democracy can extract for rolling over the option of revolutionary justice. Chapter five is where I make this my book, which is why that's the chapter I sent uh, for you to read. It's also rather technical, so I'm eager to hear how you all respond to it. And in the meanwhile, I've tried to give you some context for our discussion to come. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, we will go on to the, to the discussants. Uh, Argentino Banjua is the first discussant. Argentino is a third year student at Miser, uh, preparing for his comprehensive examination, which is mainly in political theory not in political economy. Um, so, so let's see how he builds a bridge between the two. Argentino. Um, thank you, Professor Meister, for the seminar and for giving the context to the readings that we were given for this seminar. <clears throat> and thank you, Professor Mamdani, for giving me the opportunity to discuss Professor Meister's forthcoming book. Hearing uh, Professor Meister speaking, I got somehow convinced that I should skip my summary of the argument in the text that we're given. I think this has been a very, very uh, detailed uh, 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 summary of the arguments that uh, in the text that were given, but also in the chapters that were not given to us. But I think because of the time, I'll begin by going through the sketch of the argument as I read it in the text that we're given. And then I will uh, end with a couple of questions to Professor Meister uh, as a way of enabling us to further understand the argument that he has put before us today. <clears throat> so I'll begin with how I read the texts that were given to us. Uh, Professor Meister's listening these texts uh, uh, book can be located in the tradition of critical 
uh, uh, writings against capitalism uh, established by, the, uh, by Karl Marx. In this book, Professor Meister reflects on the events of 2007 and 2008 to ask some political questions on the idea of justice coached through the language of finance, which he has called justice as an option. Uh, Professor Meister senses a paradox uh, in 2008, uh, and he says that in 2008, the financial system became politically invulnerable at, at the very moment when its survival was, at, was in doubt. So then Professor Meister asks, why did the heightened awareness of the fragility of the financial system in 2008 result in a political consensus in favor of supporting it at all costs, even when this meant allowing economic inequality to increase rather than intensifying efforts to reduce it. Professor Meister is convinced that any critique of capitalist accumulation today has to come to terms with the different circumstances in which such accumulation happens today. But this general awareness of a shift from a predominantly industrial phase of capitalism, uh, cogently analyzed by Karl Marx in the 19th century, into the contemporary moment of globalized finance must be accompanied by moving analysis of the contemporary moment in the breadth, as he says, in the breadth and depth comparable to Marx's account of capitalist industrialization. So in a way here, you can read Professor Meister as suggesting uh, the need for das capital of our contemporary moment. The financialization of capitalism, Professor Meister locates in the decades following the 1970s with quote, the pervasive growth of financial ways of thinking and financial technologies that have made the financial sector hegemonic and the alternatives to its political power much more difficult to imagine and bring about. Central to the technologies that are uh, th that he explores are those that were propagated by Fisher Black, Milton Scholes, Robert Martin, commonly known as the BSM models in the 1970s. And part of the wider plot in Professor Meister's book is to acknowledge the contribution of these eminent economists and try to squeeze out a possibility of using BN BSM models to push for an anti-capitalist critique, which is framed in the book as historical justice. So in the search, as again, as Professor elaborated in his uh, presentation, in the search for an effective anti-capitalist critique that fits the contemporary moment of financialized capitalism, Professor Meister begins with the appreciation of Prof Professor Timothy Mitchell's insight that quote, during Marx's lifetime, anti-capitalist resistance depended on the generalization, not on the generalization of commodity production, but rather from techno-social conditions surrounding the transition from wood to coal as the source of energy. So Professor Meister's update to this thesis is to argue that today, the task requires us to come to with the global technologies of financial accumulation that now enable the current energy extraction system to exist. So in this, uh, Professor Meister argues that our contemporary moment is a moment of financialized, dollarized, and globalized capitalism, so dependent on the existence of liquidity. This transition was effected in 1970s, effectively enabled by the BSM models models that continuously create liquidity through technologies of pricing financial derivatives. An awareness of this reality has to drive the anti-capitalist critique to the identification of choke points, as Professor Mitchell calls them, of the system. And Professor Meister is convinced that the radical dependence of financialized capitalism on liquidity which liquidity is harder to guarantee internally under market conditions, has made the system radically dependent on the avenues for outside liquidity, 
always provided by the state. So the contemporary version of capitalism is a debt generating machine. And in his historicization of it since the 1970s, Professor Meister notes that it exploits precarity by making all of us think that all of a sudden we are quite too worthy, which comes with a ticket to indebted our way into the future through consumption. If it is true that the securities industry and the securities and the security industry occupy two choke points of finance capital, Professor Meister argues that organized anti-capitalist movements must build upon this awareness. For example, he says that organized workers could exert collective power to threaten popular repossession of that which financial markets value as collateral and which is always already in people's hands. But if, anti, if one anti-capitalist struggle in these times can be conceived in terms of a revolution, which aims at fundamentally destroying capital accumulated through securities markets, another possibility, and this is what Professor Meister explores in chapter five, is to think how the technologies of creating liquidity through the pricing of financial derivatives, the BSM models, can be appropriated to make a moving case for historical justice. This requires to come to terms with the fact of radical dependence of finance, financial capital on sustained liquidity. If the state is always needed to stabilize finance capital through liquidity guarantees, then Professor Meister argues that BSM tools can be used to make an argument, quote, capital, that capital markets should pay a premium for the put it receives from government to restore market liquidity. That premium needs not to be in form of cash. It could be a financial asset, such as a long call, that appreciates in value as markets recover and thus constitutes a growing claim against accumulated wealth. So if we are known to let the reckless financial elite to lose during times of illiquidity, they must be made to pay and the gains be politically used and quote, for those who would otherwise be further disadvantaged by the perpetuation and compounding of historical injustice. And that's on page eight in chapter two. But this, cannot be, but this cannot come automatically as Professor Meister shows. And this is where he inserts the role of organized democratic struggle against capitalism today. So Professor Meister portrays the role of uh, struggle against finance capital as uh, a way of demanding that the payments of premium be the precondition of any bailout of financial markets. So in brief, that's how I read the texts that uh, Professor Meister provided us. And I think all this has been well, uh, 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 again, elaborated in the, in the presentation that Professor Meister has provided. So I have five questions uh, uh, for Professor Meister, um, again, as a way of enabling us to further understand the argument in, arguments in this new book. So my first question relates to the motivation to think justice as an option. I think we need to hear more from Professor Meister on this, especially given the fact that in the margins of the book, there is also another possibility, that of revolutionary justice, one that will once and for all destroy the conditions upon which the contemporary finance capital rests. Why should we need to append a democratic struggle? Why should we need to append democratic struggle against finance capital on the demand that the state puts a premium on offering liquidity in moments of crisis? Why do we need to depend on economic rationality in the struggle for historical justice? The second question re relates to the point of intersection between finance capital and industrial capital. It is clear that Professor Meister's argument is based on the conception of a shift in capitalist exploitation and accumulation. 
In this, the argument is that unlike in the time of Marx, ours is a moment predominated by finance capitalism. In our time, there is a radical dependence on industrial capital. There is a radical dependence of industrial capital on mechanisms set by finance capital. This is another point, which in the, in the text that we have provided to us at least is not well elaborated. I think maybe this is clear in the other chapters. Is all the more important if we think of context where industry is still a promise that drives elections. In Uganda, for example, there is a, now a political talk of rapid import substitution industrialization in the post COVID-19 era. So my question is this, would not an elaboration of the intersection between finance and industry imply a further rethinking of the methods of anti-capitalist struggle articulated in this book? In addition to the above, and this is my third question or call, uh, I also call upon Professor Meister to say more about the theory of anti-capitalist agency articulated in the case of finance capital. If the miners, rail workers, factory workers occupied choke points, as Professor Mitchell calls them, through which to bring down or to bring to a halt the coal-based industrial capitalism, who occupies such choke points today? under finance capital. So <clears throat> my fourth question uh, relates to the thinking about historical justice. And here Professor Meister is not bothered whether the trigger of illiquidity uh, may come from uh, the case of 2008, 2007, or from disasters uh, uh, as the contemporary case of COVID-19 pandemic. In the afterward, Professor Meister agrees that this pandemic has triggered another moment where government liquidity is needed to guarantee continuity, to guarantee continued liquidity of financial markets. But COVID-19 has also triggered a peculiar mode of social existence manifest in the lockdowns and the so-called post-COVID-19 normalcy of physical and social distancing. Under these circumstances, how should we think of organized anti-capitalist struggle to ensure, as Professor Meister tells us, that the financial elite pay premium as a precondition for any government bailout? This is more of a question to call upon Professor Meister to think about modes of democratic mobilization and struggle against capitalism in the post-COVID-19 era. That is, if we take seriously the talk of the new normal of physical and social distancing in the post COVID-19 period. And my last question relates to the relation of what Professor Meister calls historical justice and what Professor Mamdani has, has called political justice. Uh, if I may put it maybe rather crudely, when does historical justice translate into political justice? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Adventino. Um, we will go straight to uh, Professor Tim Mitchell. Uh, Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Mahmoud, for the um, invitation to, to be back in the MISER community. It's uh, always wonderful to um, be part of these discussions. Uh, thank you, Bob, for the opportunity um, to discuss this and to Adventino for his comments, um, some of which I will uh, uh, be echoing. Um, I just want to apologize for the fact that uh, I only discovered very recently that the session was moved in time and I have another meeting at one o'clock that I cannot get out of. So I'm going to miss part of the discussion, but I see that the recording button is on and that I hope um, it will be possible to catch up with the the parts of the uh, the discussion that I, that I miss when I have to leave in about 45 minutes. I'm, uh, I'm very sorry about that. Um, so Bob is, is this remarkable thing. He's, he's a political philosopher, um, uh, but also someone who um, has uh, 
this remarkable understanding of of um, of finance and political economy at, at, at the technical level. I can't I, I can't think of any other thinker today who combines those two um, abilities in in the same way. And I really um, take his work as a model for what a critical political economy can be. That that holding together in in both hands. Um, uh, the, the philosophical and moral concerns with with um, uh, a, a question of justice, um, with uh, uh, the technical ability to um, explore where the fights for that justice m might might be moved. Um, I'm going to very quickly. Um, break down what I have to say into three points um, where I think he's helping us see things in new ways and I'll try and append uh, a question or two to each of my three points the conscious of the fact that time is short. The first um, one and in, in, in ways the most general starting the level of generalization is trying to help us see what we mean by uh, financialization globalization by the particular form of capitalism that we have been living through over the last half century or so, and to see it differently from most of the common accounts, that it's not something about the increasing power of the, the banking sector or the finance sector over um, industry, for example, but that it is has at its heart this fundamental change in a pricing system. Um, and I'm not going to repeat because Adventino has, has, has already summarized the argument well. Um, this, this new power of making um, every income earning asset potentially liquid um, and how that financial technology works and understanding it as a technology for creating what become risk-free investments. That's to say investments where the value of the income earning asset can be separated from um, the risk that might be involved and the two priced separately, creating what he calls a sort of artificial treasury bond, something as secure, as reliable as a government um, uh, created and backed investment vehicle, but organized and produced in private hands. And that, that works not just somewhere called the, the, the financial sector, because what is being priced through these new mechanisms is essentially um, anything uh, that can be made into an asset of this sort. Um, and therefore trans transforming all of how, how all of economic life works, um, uh, including not just in the US where uh, some of his examples are focused, but also because as he explains in um, some of the earlier parts of the books, because this was also a way of um, uh, making equivalent um, the, the value of assets in one part of the world and the value in another by making um, uh, all, uh, by, by producing a way of making all currencies commensurable with the dollar um, in, in, the, in the decades after the abandoning of the gold standard. So it, it, it's, it's this understanding at the technical level of, um, of this pricing technology and getting away from the notions that this is about something fictitious or something um, ephemeral that doesn't exist um, uh, somehow at the level of ordinary productive life. That's where it is located and that's where it works and it's very useful comparisons in the book with, in, in earlier chapters again, with the work of Marx, both distinguishing this argument from Marx's own understanding of what he called fictitious capital, as Bob mentioned in passing um, in his comments as well. Um, uh, but I think the comparison with Marx is also useful for thinking what it is that he is telling us, that, that Bob Meister is telling us here in this account. Um, you know, one way one could characterize Marx is um, he is standing and uh, Marx in in the focus in, in volume one of Capital on this this institution this this mechanism of the factory is essentially giving us the history of pricing technology because what the factory is is not simply a way of um, uh, producing material goods in, in a new way it's a it's a machine 
that sets in place the prices of, um, in particular, the labor um, out of which the surplus is, is going to be produced. So I, I, I think sort of using analogies to the way Marx wrote about 19th century capitalism to understand that what's at stake in these kinds of mechanisms and techniques is just as central to the way we live today as the factory was, um, and still is, of course, um, to the capitalism that Marx wrote about. Um, and there's also this really important aspect of this because this novel pricing mechanism or this pricing mechanism that in its novel aspects is deployed on this whole new scale is about, um, uh, it's, it's about the pricing of risk and the separation of that risk, as he says, from an underlying asset. Um, and therefore, it's about the future. And, and as he said in his remarks today, it's about um, uh, the ability to profit from uh, the uncertainty of the future. Um, it, it's out of that, both the uncertainty, but also our increasing ability to measure and price that uncertainty um, becomes itself uh, uh, a process out of which um, profit can be made, surplus um, can be realized. So my question about this first aspect of his work is really um, to have him explain whether, um, whether the option, whether the, 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 um, uh, the proliferation of this mode of um, uh, making things liquid through the device of the option. Um, is by definition the producer of crisis, not just because things tend to get out of hand from time to time, but because there's something actually built into the mechanism, namely, as I understand it in his explanation, its dependence, to put it simply, on the periodic government bailout. And that that is something not just that happens to happen because um, crises come along, but because there's something in the method of pricing itself, um, something in the technology itself that is productive of the crisis, even if the trigger has to be um, something that, as it were, comes from outside or uh, uh, that the, 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 this way of realizing surplus you know, has those uh, aspects that make it um, uh, dependent on, on the bailout in a, in a new kind of way. Um, so just trying to understand the relationship between crisis and the moments of crisis that are central to the analysis and the technique of the option um, itself. So the second thing he's, he's um, brought into view for us and talked to us about is, um, and, and this is what I find um, so useful and it's something I've, I've, I've tried to, to, to puzzle and think through, but without anything like the, um, uh, the understanding that Bob brings to it, is to understand where exactly is the point of techno-political vulnerability in the, this new world and drop through the parallels with some of the things I'd thought about exactly the sort of factory system of the 19th century and even the larger sort of industrial world of the 20th century um, with this kind of world that we live in today. Um, uh, and um, I, I, I just find, I, I just want to sort of highlight how important this work is for the need to politically understand not just that, that there's extraordinary injustice and that contemporary systems of finance live off and perpetuate that injustice, but rather the reverse, that even though we have to understand its power to do that, that power is based on very specific technical points of vulnerability. And, um, using Bob's work to understand exactly where that vulnerability um, lies is um, enormously useful. I, I guess I have sort of two questions about that, which I think are addressed at greater length in the book, but not here. Um, one, again, a, a lot of the analysis is focused here on the US case. The story is sort of 
turns around 2008 and then with the current crisis um, added uh, as an afterword. Um, but of course, one can think of um, broader aspects of the same process that would be um, the way this operates on a, on, a, on a more global level. And particularly, I'm thinking of, of the phenomenon of, of third world debt. Um, uh, because of course austerity was a was a regime that was imposed in um, uh, in countries of the north, but even more so um, uh, a, a regime um, uh, imposed across the global south. And um, I, I wonder in what ways your argument um, works for that aspect of the, the global financial system that are uh, slightly beyond the cases we've been looking at in the discussion so far today. Um, and related to that, just to sort of relate it to today, um, uh, as, as you remark it sort of in passing in the afterword, um, there are significant differences between the bailout that has happened now um, in response to the COVID-19 crisis and the, the bailout of um, the banks um, and the financial sector in 2007 to 2009. Um, the previous one was essentially providing liquidity to the financial sector, to the banking sector. This one is this vast creation of, of liquidity, of, 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 of credit um, across a, a, a a much broader realm for, for the corporate sector, for the oil industry, the airline industry, um, uh, the large corporate sector across the board. And, um, and, and some of the discussion of it has been on that difference between uh, a banking bailout in 2018 and a corporate bailout this time around. Um, and I think there's a lot in your analysis that could help us understand that difference, though I, I think, I, I, I guess the afterword is just a brief sketch at this moment. And I, I, I'd like to have a better understanding of, um, of where that difference lies, because um, and uh, as I would understand it, part of it is that this um, creation of liquidity that you talk about, this, this um, uh, and profiting from forms of liquidity happens not only in the banking and the financial sector, but equally in the corporate sector in the sense that corporations themselves over the last um, two, three decades have been transformed into these financial entities much more than they are simply uh, manufacturing entities or business or service entities. That is to say, as you know, the, the whole point of the corporation has been this uh, understood and redefined in economics and in the business world as the production of shareholder value, not the production of jobs, not the production of goods, not the production of, um, of services of one kind or another, but the production of this financial surplus for the shareholder. So corporations themselves have become, as it were, like banks um, uh, in a certain sense. And I'm, I'm not sure how your argument, whether it's simply the same argument when you move from the financial sector per se into thinking what it, but, but given that this crisis has shifted now to have this new focus, I'd be um, curious to know uh, whether that, as it were, sort of changes the points of vulnerability in some way. Um, and then the third thing I want to draw out again that has, um, uh, has come out in Adventino's um, comments and in Bob's own summary this morning um, is the attempt to have this sort of practical focus on what kind of politics can take advantage of a better understanding of how, how this system works and where its vul vulnerabilities lies and this um, uh, remarkable uh, analysis developed in chapter five are using the very tools of um, financial macroeconomics to um, devise a, a, a political strategy or at least a political claim by understanding 
that, um, to put it simply, the bailout has an extraordinary value that doesn't have to be captured, or even the promise um, of a future bailout, the, the, the knowledge that bailouts will come in the future has this extraordinary um, financial value that um, is a vast resource that could be made available, could be claimed, um, and not simply handed um, for free to um, uh, the, 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 the immediate beneficiaries. Um, uh, and your suggestion that, um, that the pricing of this, um, let's call it this bailout option, um, is the arena in which we could um, open up claims for uh, historical justice. So I guess um, the questions I have about that um, would be, and uh, this is said completely in sympathy with the need to open up this kind of techno-political understanding of this vulnerability and of this form of wealth creation that takes place through public institutions but is not recognized that. Um, what makes this premium easier to extract and use for purposes of political justice? What, what makes it easier to do that than other kinds of um, uh, resources already extracted by the state? I mean, the state, of course, um, raises taxes, um, sells off uh, the rights to use all kinds of public resources, the right to pollute, um, the right to use um, mineral resources. At, at every level, there are sort of premiums, as it were, in the hands of the state that end up being used for very specific kinds of private gain. Now, I still think there's enormous value to understanding this new premium that's no, no even a really aware of how to think about. But there does seem to be a continuing problem that with the existence of such premiums, um, turning them into things that become understood to be public rather than private goods um, is a, um, it, 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 it's not obvious what the step towards that is. Um, but let me just sort of close by suggesting one, um, one element that might be part of that. And this is, comes from my sense that we can't all be Bob Meisters. That's to say, we can't all as individual, whether scholars or activists or um, just politically engaged citizens, master both these worlds. The world of finance on the one hand and the, the, the world of um, of questions of political justice on the other. So is part of the political answer to the question I just posed, thinking about what kind of forums can actually sort of um, uh, be designed to operate as sort of collective Bob Meisters, um, collective bringing, togethers, bringing together of these forms of insight and understanding, um, that is to say, of, of the activist, the political theorist, but also the financial macroeconomist and even the financial market actor um, in some way that, um, that this political awareness that I think you think is vital to this project actually has a specific sort of mode of being produced other than us in our usual way, writing our articles and books and putting them out there. Um, so is that just to sort of bring it down to a more concrete level of, of, of as it were, political forum for this, is, is there some way in which you see that as part of this project? And again, thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Um, Bob, I think, uh up to about 15 minutes for you to engage with these and then we move on to a broader discussion. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both of you. Uh, let me uh, just address these in the order in which I uh, wrote them down. Uh, 
Uh, first, I want to say uh, how much uh, I appreciate the uh, the nuanced uh, reading of uh, of my work uh, uh, that uh, uh, both commentators have given. Uh, it's um, uh, always a possibility when I present this work that uh, people will simply be allergic to it because it uses the language of finance. Uh, and most people who share my concern for justice uh, blame injustice on the language of finance, uh, which is the tool of the uh, of the um, of financial sector power. So most people uh, who blame uh, injustice on uh, the power that is exerted uh, through uh, uh, monopolistic access to that language uh, are uh, are likely to think uh, that uh, the way to resist uh, is to uh, resist the language. And that by resisting the language, uh, you uh, you resist the power. And uh, uh, I do sometimes encounter that but as a risk. Uh, and uh, I did not uh, see that here. Uh, I thought that uh, the uh, uh, restatement of what I was saying and what I was doing, uh, particularly. Uh, uh, in regard to to using this discourse and this language, not merely hegemonically, uh, but uh, but counter hegemonically, uh, was something that uh, uh, that seemed to uh, to take hold uh, in uh, in in both responses. And I just want to say how much I appreciate that fact. Uh, now let me. Uh, Adventino's questions first, uh, if I can read what I wrote. Um, and uh, Syrianum, uh, first question is, uh, yeah, justice is an option, but why not revolution? And um, I'd say uh, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a perfectly appropriate question to ask, given my presentation. Because my presentation is that is an argument that unless revolution is uh, is uh, is uh, implicit uh, in democracy, unless democracy always carries with it a revolutionary potential, democracy is simply a technology for manufacturing consent, and so. It is my argument in part that democracy has to be understood if it is to be meaningful politically as acting a price for the deferral revolution. Uh, I think the impetus behind Adventino's question is uh, largely to stress that fact, uh, which, is, uh, which is of course a point with which I agree. Uh, that unless there are people who say why not revolution, democracy is worthless. Uh, I think I think uh, I, I think uh, that said, uh, uh, democracy is a technology for deferring revolution in the way that uh, finance is a technology for deferring illiquidity, uh, and that the vulnerability of both lies in uh, in liquidity and and revolution. And I want to uh, present, and I think this is important uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a way of elucidating and elaborating what I tried to say originally, I want to present these two facts, not merely as a source of strength. Oh, democracy suppresses revolution. Oh, finance uh, uh, suppresses illiquidity. I want to present them as also, a, 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 a technopolitical, in Tim's sense, a technopolitical source of vulnerability. Uh, second point uh, that Adventino made is about industry. Uh, yeah, uh, what uh, 
has clearly happened as capitalism has become financialized is that uh, the industrial dimensions of it have become dispersed uh, and globalized. Uh, and uh, there is work to be done uh, uh, at the level of, uh, of an analysis of liquidity uh, in showing how finance has made that possible. Uh, in, other, in other words, finance has become a technique uh, for setting, uh, not merely, and, and this, is, this is where I, 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 I'm not necessarily differing from him. Marx dresses capitalism as a homogenizing process in which everything becomes subject to a common denominator. Uh, my view is that finance moves beyond the simple techniques of homogenization uh, to develop techniques for, for, uh, for, for, uh, for creating parities among uh, incommensurable, culturally incommensurable, politically incommensurable, historically incommensurable phenomena. And, uh, and, and making those vehicles for creating parodies among liquid. So I, I don't, as, as, as much as I should, I suppose, I don't address, for example, the, uh, the, uh, the continued uh, uh, reinstantiation of originary injustice, what Marx called primitive accumulation, as something that is incommensurable with capitalism, but on which capitalism depends. On the other hand, I, I would argue that financialization is the means by which that becomes uh, incorporated without necessarily being commensurated in the process. And I think that the organization, uh, uh, and again, uh, I did notice uh, the second time I was in uh, uh, Kampala in the last decade that uh, uh, that uh, that China had has had an impact. Uh, I, I I I think uh, setting at parity the incommensurable systems that the U.S. and the and China uh, are imposing, or at least that the Western capitalist world and China are imposing in places uh, like East Africa uh, uh, as modes. Of, of, of production uh, would be an important addition to my analysis. Uh, about uh, anti-capitalist agency, about the choke points, um, that is uh, a topic I try to address at least uh, illustratively <coughs> chapters of the book. Uh, I, I think uh, I think uh, it's important for me to acknowledge that that there's an element of surprise here that this can't be done prescriptively. That uh, what I'm trying to do in part is to show how a counter hegemonic use of financial discourse as not simply an instrument of power but a confession of vulnerability on the part of capital is important to the articulation. Of, of movements that do emerge. Uh, but uh, far be it from me to say that, uh, uh, that these movements have to emerge in, in one sphere of life uh, rather than another. I'm really trying to pre present techniques uh, for them to think about uh, the instabilities that they create and how to benefit, uh, you know, from, from, I mean, look, our notion of movement building today is that maybe some movement will uh, get viral enough to go over the top <laughs> and, uh, and, and survive. And we, we, we need some model other than a model of contagion if we're going to build a movement that rather exploits contagion on capital as the way in which threatened. And so, I mean, what we're really trying to do is to create a kind of contagious illiquidity in capital without requiring that our movements necessarily go contagious. We're trying to develop a way in which movements of any kind uh, uh, really are invested in each other's success in some ways.
uh, and, uh, and, 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 and they pass the baton to each other. Uh, so I don't necessarily want to preclude uh, movements in one or, or another sphere just because uh, that's where my polit own political uh, uh, proclivities might lie. Uh, fourth question of Adventino is COVID-19. Uh, how well social distancing? Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, this is uh, very much uh, in the uh, in the news today. I uh, because it's such a moving target. Of course, I rewrote the afterword after sending it to you. Uh, version in the full manuscript I sent to Tim. Then then uh, and, uh, and then 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 you seen the social distancing. Of course, uh, creates new taboos that can be transgressed, and that's what's happening now. In other words, transgressing the social distancing becomes itself a form of protest when the effects of COVID-19 uh, appear to be, as they have been, uh, reinforcements and, uh, and compoundings of pre-existing injustice or rather than mitigations uh, or, uh, or, or confessions of those injustices. And, uh, and so, uh, 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 yes, it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult to uh, mobilize when you can't gather, but then gathering becomes a way of protesting uh, how it is that the bailout, and this is a point that Tim also raised, is affecting um, the the, uh, the, uh, the existing uh, world. And 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 there's also, you know, I I, I mentioned in the preface, uh, my friend. Uh, uh, Randy Martin, who was interested in the relationship of uh, movements to, to physical movement, uh, to the choreography, the kinesthetics of, 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 of movement. And uh, this is certainly an area in which we're seeing a lot of experimentation today. Uh, uh, and so uh, um, Randy's work on the kinest theme has never been more relevant, uh, I think, or at least is becoming newly relevant when we see hands going up and knees being taken and, and so on and so forth. There's a choreograph uh, that Adventino's question uh, uh, invites us to consider, uh, but uh, I wish Randy were still alive to help us think about it more because I'm not the person uh, to talk about how to move one's body. Um, and uh, then uh, Adventino asked, what does historical justice look like? Well, my answer to that question is something that we can afford and not precisely what we can no longer afford. And that to the extent that my argument demonstrates that, uh, I will have done enough. Uh, now, now for Tim again. I, I uh, always appreciate Tim's thinking, and uh, uh, now, uh, now especially because I keep on re returning to it. Um, first question goes to the heart of what I'm saying. Uh, one way of reading chapter five in particular is that it stresses the political contingency of finance. Oh, it depends upon government bailout. Well, the government doesn't necessarily have to do it because the government doesn't necessarily have to do it. How it does it is important because it, how it does it uh, needs to be uh, uh, in a way find it unthinkable not to do it and we'll do whatever it takes and so what we have is a stress on on the political contingency uh and tim rightly points out that that is in uh, potential tension uh maybe the rest of the argument uh in uh, uh in uh, chapter five uh which is that there's necessity here 
Uh, that is to say that the essence of uh, the black scholes merton formula is to show that the private the pricing of private debt depends upon regarding it as synthetically produced public debt and that that's the essence of the issue so that this apparent vulnerability of governments willing to recognize that this is what's going on uh, as a source of vulnerability in capitalism uh, actually conceals the way in which a deep reading, which is admittedly uh, not benefiting from uh, an ability to do the Ito calculus on which the thing depends, uh, but a deep reading is that uh, Black-Scholes demonstrates that uh, uh, that privately created derivatives are synthetically created public debt is is the essence of capitalism. And uh, I just want to thank Tim for pointing out uh, something that I could have better emphasized, which is the compatibility rather than the tension between these two lines of thinking. Uh, the uh, second point, if I can read what I wrote, uh, is about uh, the uh, possible parochialism of my argument as uh, specific to the United States and to uh, the role of the United States in the world. Um, that could have been more fully addressed it is addressed in later chapters pointing to uh, particularly the work of uh, financial macroeconomists, because a lot of these guys are working for IMF, uh, which is of course what's imposing austerity. And uh, the financial macroeconomist at MIT, Ricardo Caballero, the Chilean, uh, writes about the economics of sudden financial distress and how I am therefore austerity to create a demand uh, for investment of governments under IMF constraints uh, to hold more and more of their reserves in the form of liquid US government debt. So, so that the economics of IMF austerity is that the entire world depends upon the willingness of the United States to supply liquidity, which is both the source, as some of these macroeconomists say, of the US's ability to extract a surplus, they call it exorbitant privilege, but it's also an exorbitant duty uh, that, uh, that, that, that creates a flight to US government assets as the real underlying condition of, uh, uh, of austerity that the the IMF is it 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 actual it actually uh, uh, magnifies and leverages U.S. power in the world uh, as uh, as people who stress the uh, the implicit or hidden imperialism of the IMF uh, like uh, to emphasize. Um, I don't know whether Tim had three questions or four. Uh, the the uh, question that I have coming out here uh, makes it feel like for uh, what is the relationship between financial bailout of 2008 and its extension to the corporate bailout uh, that exists in 2020? Uh, I would take it a step further. There was a corporate bailout, of course, in 2008. It was the bailout of GM. Uh, uh, I think that is raised by the extension to other industries is the question of whether and to what extent it will extend to the question of income support. In other words, whether whether in the end, uh, to move beyond to move beyond simply saying, oh well, we're going to uh, get, let people take on debt that uh, uh, we may uh, also uh, 
uh, at least allow people to hope will be forgiven or deferred or whatever indefinitely because we manufacture debt. And uh, the relationship between that and, and literally, literally having the government make money or allowing people to make their own money. Uh, I think uh, that what we are really moving toward here when we move from financial bailout to corporate bailout is the question of income bailout and the question of how that affects the currency and, uh, and particularly how that also creates demands for uh, alternative currencies and the ability to hedge alternative currencies and so forth. And, 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 and subsequent chapters address that issue, but, uh, but I do think it's important, uh, it's important to see where this is headed. Uh, we're already seeing a range of bailouts uh, uh, that uh, uh, are on a spectrum between uh, the Danish idea that we should simply pay everyone not to work and bail out everyone and the more American idea that what we need to do is to increase uh, because of the importance of the U.S. financial sector in the world, we need to increase the confidence of the U.S. financial sector that it will come first because of course it is far more important than the in the world than the than the Danish financial sector is, and and then finally uh, the question is why not why not use or spending or why not you know there are lots of simple techniques that you can use like penalizing government uh, buyouts or or Tobin taxes on financial transactions, uh, or all sorts of things. Uh, and my answer to that is, uh, is ambivalent. Uh, chapter six on funding justice is, uh, is a history of political economy. You know, one of uh, uh, the great gifts I've, uh, has always been the senior colleagues who have come here when I was younger, and one of them was Richard Musgrave, who was a uh, who was finance and uh, should have won the Nobel Prize, and with whom I co-taught for for some years because the economics department didn't want to, uh, but, uh, but but we found we found a place for him, and I I I'm highly highly influenced by the ways in which that tradition of public finance, and he was a Schumpeter. Uh, uh, Alvin Hansen students that that tradition of public finance uh, is important, can be mobilized. I write about uh, uh, how it is that Minsky uh, was a path not taken in the 1970s and is a path that could have been taken. Ultimately, my answer to Tim's question is that all of these techniques focused primarily on GDP. And uh, I want to focus on accumulated wealth. It's a much larger continent to be explored. Mahmoud is telling me I'm over time. Thank you, Bob. You'll have more time um, after more questions. So thank you very much. I'm going to open this up. Uh, please. Uh, just send me your name and uh, institutional affiliation in chat if you if you wish to ask a question um, or make a comment. Um, okay, Gilanidjar, please, Gil. <coughs> Thank you. I, I didn't expect to go first. Uh, um, hi, Bob. It's really great, great, uh, great to listen to you. Uh, uh, it's exhilarating to uh, read you and, and, and think with you. And so uh, I have 3,000 questions, but I'll try to, uh, um, to condense them. Uh, I do want to say that I think that there's a lot to think about with regard to what you talk to describe as the autoimmune. Um, and, and very much the question of what actually 
uh, appears as an exteriority as opposed to that which appears interior. Uh, and, and given COVID and what you said about COVID as being or not being yet proven to be political, uh, uh, not to mention possibly financial, uh, um, and, and how one would actually make that distinction seems to me uh, incredibly productive. Uh, um, my first question is about risk. I, obviously, I love, and I think I've already told you this, uh, uh, the fact that you call the, 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 the suicide bombers of Wall Street. Now, the suicide bomber, bombers of Wall Street are people who have managed to convince all of us that they have the biggest bomb. In other words, they constitute the biggest risk. They have their finger on the detonator that constitutes the biggest risk. And what you're saying is we could, and yet we haven't, convince everybody else that we, the potential revolutionaries, we the left, we, we, are in fact at least as big a risk. And, and I think that uh, um, I'm not clear on what, what our sign is, right? They have the finger on the trigger. A suicide bomber has the thing on the trigger. You see the risk. Whether, right. whether the, the belt is armed or not armed uh, doesn't matter. What matters is they have their finger on the trigger and uh um and they are and they are terrorizing so um so that's one question what is it that can constitute us or that can constitute the formation of uh, of a mechanism whereby historical justice becomes an asset um as as a, a, a mechanism to avoid the risk of, uh, uh, of, um, of revolution as at least as big a risk as the illiquidity that with which the, the, bond, the bankers. In other words, we have to align ourselves and we say we have the bigger bomb or hey, we have our finger on, on, a, on a detonator too. And the next question, which I think is more trivial, uh, uh, although I, I would like to, to uh, just hear what you have to say, is that I took the argument of after evil to interrogate the very description of, of um, injustice as being past. Though I understand what you're saying now in terms of the cumulative effect of injustice, but I took you to also say, we should not take injustice in after evil we should not take injustice as being only past. So when you talk about the rollover of the option, of the revolutionary option, of the illiquidity op option, wouldn't a consideration that injustice is not past, but ongoing and in fact very much present, whatever it means for a Derridian like me to say that word, um, and there's a lot about difference that can be said as well, the autoimmune being, of course, also a Derridian uh, trope. Um, but what happens when injustice is not just historical, but in fact is, you know, to use the Benjamin image, is actually mounting in front of us, right? As we speak, the storm is accumulating ruins now. And whether we name it George Floyd is, uh, uh, is, um, is of course just one way of making it uh, uh, concrete. So the rollover appears to uh, partake of in fact the rolling over of injustice. Since this very system of inequality is, is the production of injustice as we speak. So your insistence on past wrong seemed to me to uh, and perhaps I'm misunderstanding, but it seems to me to run counter to your own argument in after evil. Namely, we are not after evil, right? That is part of the conceit. Um, we are in evil. We are within evil. We are evil, we might even say, right? I mean, those of us who are the beneficiaries. Uh, um, and so I, I'm just curious about where, where does history uh, as something else than past and Tim, of course, was pushing you on the future, which, um, which is another part of the same question. But uh, um, 
uh, where, where is history in, in the argument as you're making it now? Thank you. Really, really uh, fascinating stuff. Bob, go ahead. Uh, okay. And, and we'll take other questions later. Well, yes. I mean, as always, Gil, Gil, uh, Gil reads me uh, profoundly. Uh, I am taking uh, what uh, appears to be an exteriority to capitalism, a source of its power over its other, uh, and interiorizing it as uh, as a deep as a deep vulnerability and. Uh, 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 and I, that, uh, uh, as he puts it, suicide bombers have presented, or at least those suicide bombers of Wall Street uh, have presented themselves as, as uh, a risk to capitalism, are the principal threat to capitalism, when in fact they are the capitalists and its beneficiaries, and they are the people who should be regarded as being at risk rather than as being the risk. Uh, and that formulation of what I'm saying is, uh, as, as Gil always is, uh, profound. Um, uh, the question, I think, that is uh, implicit uh, in, 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 his, uh, in his first point uh, about that, implicit in his second point, uh, is whether uh, we can both present ourselves as the risk to them, but also whether we can claim an asset, whether we can claim an asset uh, that is historical, whether we can claim historical injustice as a financial asset. And I am trying to argue that it is a financial asset that is is meaning because I'm trying to show that it can be priced. Now, how does this relate to the argument of after evil that, uh, that we are in the evil uh, and that the human rights discourse or the humanitarian alternative to revolutionary justice is to allow the evil to compound uh, I understand where Gil is coming from, that this is, uh, uh, that we are allowing the evil to continue to the extent that we attract, extract a price for doing this. Uh, my criticism in, in after is, uh, of course, in part, that this isn't better necessarily than what a revolution would have been. Uh, that that because uh, 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 we want to claim to continue to be the risk, uh, and because we want to continue uh, to put the interests of capital at risk, uh, uh, we have an asset. Asset is the value of the historical injustice, and particularly the right at long last to benefit from it. If this wasn't what was done uh, in, uh, for example, um, South Africa, uh, although Mahmoud and I may disagree a little bit on this, uh, that this wasn't done certainly in the TRC phase of South Africa. Uh, I don't know how far some of it has been done since. Uh, but that uh, the historical injustice, the answer is not necessarily that, uh, uh, that, uh, that the evil needs to be compounding, but that rather the value of the asset contained in the historical injustice needs to be increased, and that continuing political action uh, after uh, after the revolution doesn't happen uh, is action that is contingent upon the idea that the revolution remains a, th a threat. I don't think that Mahmoud and I would disagree about so much. Okay. Um, 
let me take advantage of this lull. Uh, I think people are uh, digesting the argument and, uh, and making sure they've got it right. Um, and I'm going to take advantage of, advantage of it to make a comment uh, and ask a question. Um, I think there is a reason that people are, are, are di taking time to digest this argument. Um, and you referred to it at the very beginning. Uh, you said that uh, many people, or not many people, but some people uh, become allergic to what you're saying uh, because you're using the language of finance. Uh, and, uh, and they want you to use the uh, a more familiar language, a, a more, in quotes, progressive language. A, and, and I guess I've heard you say this before in other contexts that uh, a, Marx used the language of the political economists, a, the language of, 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 the, of the very people that he was criticizing. Um, and, and using the language of, of finance here is not uh, uh, succumbing uh, paradigmatically uh, uh, to it, uh, but it's a takeoff point in a way. So the challenge for us is to uh, understand you in the language of finance, because we're not conversant with the language of finance. Um, so to understand the argument that you're making, and then to figure out uh, what is new. Uh, uh, it, 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 and is the new is is the new being obscured uh, by the language itself? Um, so this is a challenge for me too, uh, is to figure this out. And I'll put it very simply in terms of uh, uh, how I understood this. Um, I think a basic claim is that capitalism in, is no longer a 19th century industrial capitalism that Marx wrote about. I think you're also telling us that it's also not the finance capitalism that Lenin wrote about. Uh, it's not about the relationship between uh, banks or financial institutions uh, and industries. Uh, but really this is a kind of an amoeba-like uh, uh, overarching uh, pervasive influence of, of finance. Uh, whereby the market is not simply a market in commodities, but you have a market in liquidities, you have a market in options, um, and everything as it were kind of has its afterlife in this market of options, market of, market of liquidities. Um, and the challenge, as I understood you, to be saying is that we need to make the corporate sector pay a premium. Uh, so if I use the analogy of insurance, right? The market on, I understand the, 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 the second market you're talking about uh, as, as really sort of a large scale development uh, to the point where it's, it's, it's beyond just a complement. Uh, of, of, a, of a mega insurance sector kind of, and, and as you pay inch premium uh, for, for, for insurance, uh, you want the corporate sector to pay premium on this. So the first question uh, which arises is the politics of this. Uh, and that's, that's the question that, uh, that uh, Adventino asked you. Um, there is the demand must get the corporate sector to pay premium. Um, and there is the constituency which must make that demand. Uh, what change and who is to make this change? What demand and who is to make this demand? And, and when asked that question, you said you don't want to be prescriptive. Uh, you, you're not, you, 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 you don't want to be saying who is to make this demand. Um, but I don't think it's an unfair question. Uh, who, who are these grave diggers 
uh, that you're talking about. Uh, because we, we know the language of grave diggers from Marx, uh, and, and he spells out the grave diggers as he sees them. We know how the language of grave diggers changed post Marx. Uh, 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 we know that there were, there, were, there, were, there were doubts about whether the proletariat uh, uh, could on its own change this world especially when most of the working people are not proletarian. So who are, who are these? Who are these grave diggers? What's the... Um, Tim asked the same question in a different way, which is, he asked you about the demands, not, the, not, not who is to make these demands, the demands, the, the premium to be, to be paid. And, and Tim's question, as I understood it, was, uh, what is the most strategic point of action? Uh, the premium is one of these strategic points. How, wh why, why should we consider it the most strategic point of action um, today? Sort of with COVID-19, with now a crisis which is global, absolutely global. Um, so I would I would like you to uh, to 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 elaborate on 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 the politics of what you're saying. Thank you. Okay. I think I mean what I am emphatically not saying is that everybody should set aside what they're doing and focus on the politics of the financial sector. Study what I've studied and address questions of financial macroeconomics. What I am saying is that the things that people in a wide variety of areas uh, need to be understood as raising or lowering the value of certain options. Uh, part of one of my answers to, uh, to Tim's question that I uh, uh, omitted or left uh, uh, forgot about is all of the ways in which taxation and regulation can now be understood to be affecting the value of options people have and, and, and giving them long and short positions. When I was a uh, decade ago working on the Spreman, my, my criticism of what the universities were doing when they were indebting U.S. students uh, in order to essentially uh, uh, turn college education more and more into a financial asset uh, for which students would want to borrow uh, is that, uh, that, that they were putting students in the position of taking a long position on the view that having a college degree would actually open opportunities uh, when it was pretty clear that the number of people who got college degrees was in no way increasing the number of jobs available for those people. And that the university was, was essentially uh, shorting the success of its students. And that, uh, and, that, and that part of what needs to be done in thinking about a situation like this is uh, to imagine a, a student uh, a, a, a student uh, movement uh, that tries to restore the educational value of an education as a movement that is shorting the ability of the university to create uh, to create greater opportunities. In the book, I talk about um, affirmative action uh, in, in in later chapters that I didn't send you, but I also talk about uh, inner city schools as you know, we're in the United States, 
public schools that fail are then replaced by private schools as creating a situation in which it is only the students who are along their success and the rest of the political system is short their success. Uh, what I am talking about is how it is that a movement can create a politics uh, that in many ways, uh, in many ways, in many ways go short the state from a financial, uh, using financial language, uh, and, 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 and that understands the respects in which the state defeats oppositional politics by putting the people who are its victims uh, essentially in the position of, of being the only people who are along the success of the state when the state is implicitly subsidizing capitalists who are short that success. In this case, the, uh, the student debt industry in the case of colleges uh, in the United States or, or, uh, or uh, the for-profit public school system or uh, uh, private school systems that replace public, uh, uh, public schools that fail in cities like Chicago and I assume also in New York. Uh, I'm trying to think through all of the ways in which the movement that can understand their relationship, for example, to the private industries, to the private industries that are replacing state social services under the conditions that are usually described as neoliberalism. I'm trying to give an alternative description and of the tactics that opponents of neoliberalism, for example, of which there are a great many, can and should use to identify, to identify uh, the sources of corporate power that are benefiting from the failure of the state to support groups and movements that have long positions on the ability of the state to benefit them in the way that students and universities have long positions and they're the only ones with long positions when they go into debt on the ability of universities, to study, which universities can no longer do. So you ask who are the grave diggers? Who are the agents? I am really trying to develop methods of analysis that people who are currently in oppositional standpoints can use to become the grave diggers uh, and to address the ways in which they uh, are actually being forced into uh, long positions that bet on the success of the institutions that are failing them. Thank you. Um, Anna, please go ahead and make your comment. Uh, thank you, Professor. And thank you, Professor Meister, for this opportunity. Um, this must be a, a, quite a stretch, but I would like to know if there's a possibility of a post-capitalist capitalist future in your reading of revolution as something that goes beyond whatever we might be in a position to extract um, in the current times from the system in terms of short or even the medium term, like a temporary universal basic income, and a temporary nationalization of healthcare as um, it has happened in Spain and other parts of the world. Thank you. Yes, do you, do you want me to, um, Hannah, yeah. do you want me to answer that now? Yes, please go ahead, yeah. So, yeah, I think Hannah's question raises, of course, is the way in which my answer to Tim's question suggests that uh, that income support is going to be uh, the next step uh, after the corporations get bailed out. Why shouldn't why shouldn't the U.S. do what Denmark is doing, and so on and so forth? Uh, I think that my contribution here is highly specific. My contribution is always to regard capitalism as transitional rather than natural. My contribution is to 
show that capitalism's financialization, which appears to make it permanent and strengthen it, does so by figuring out ways in which it becomes it becomes contingent. It becomes resilient by confessing its uncertainty about its own future, by by confessing the fact that it is transitional. And thus, I think in a post-capitalist future, uh, I think that what it means to talk about the financial dimension of every demand we make, including the very universal basic income, as something that potentially affects capitalism's uncertainty about its own future uh, and enhances its awareness of its own transitionality. Uh, am I a utopian theorist who says, no, uh, if we had a universal basic income, we have corrected the flaws of capitalism, uh, or that uh, if we had uh, industrial democracy, we would have corrected the flaws of industrialization? No. What I want to say is that each of these movements and each of these demands needs to be understood. Something that affects capitalism's level of uncertainty about its own possible impermanence. And that, uh, that if, we, if we bring this perspective to the question of basic income, we are talking about not merely a reform uh, that is an alternative to revolution, but something that raises the value of rolling over the revolutionary option in the present, and thus the value that can be extracted from capitalism by democracy. Thank you, Bob. Um, I seem to have killed conversation here. No, I don't think you've choked. You have triggered uh, thought. Uh, much, much thinking, and I think that uh, uh, people need to have access to the book and need to read the book. Uh, well, fortunately, and I, I wrote it by, by no means certain that I could. Okay. Uh, we're going to go back to Gil. Uh, Gil, go ahead, please. Um, um, well, since I said I had uh, uh, thousand, many questions, three, I suppose. Three thousand, I, you said you had 3,000 questions. <laughs> and, and I thought I, you were going to proceed by asking a 1,000. But, but I, I, uh, I, you know, proliferation is what it's all about. Um, so it's again two questions. One, one is your description of uh, of capital, capital's relation to life, of capitalism relation to life, and I'm wondering whether um, what you just said now about the transiency of of capitalism. Uh, relates to something that we might want to call life, but that is not quite the same as the life that capital takes care of. In other words, there's a, there's a co-constitution of a certain understanding of life that is at work in the, the, uh, the provision that, cap that capitalism makes, as you said, the production and consumption. It does, it does uh, take care of our subsistence, but in doing so, it defines our existence, it defines life, and not only ours, right, and animals, uh, uh, the planet, uh, in a particular way. And that particular way, if I had to summarize it in probably too prosaic a manner, I would have to say something of the order of calculation, right? I mean, it's a, it's a perfect cliche to, uh, to put it this way. But there's something about uh, everything that you've said, and this is, I guess, my second question, everything that you said about the probable and the possible seems to be about making 
everything, uh, bringing everything under the rule of probability. Even the notion of capitalism transiency, as you were saying, cap capitalism is able to actually bank on its own recognition that it is finite. In other words, it is not ignorant of its transiency. It is actually banking on it. It is mobilizing it. One might even say weaponizing it. And so the question is, uh, uh, and of course, this is a question of what constitutes a resistance movement, right? Uh, uh, as Mahmoud was saying, um, Marx deployed the language of political economy because this was the language that the capitalism was speaking, and you are deploying the language of finance because this is the language that, that capitalism, finance capitalism is speaking. The question is, is there any kind of translation? Is there something that is lost in translation? And how, how, do, how do you help, help us uh, um, see actually the, I, I almost want to say, the actual limits of, capital, of capitalism rather than the limits that it itself is able to, right? It's a perfectly, again, yeah. the origin question. Is, is the other of capitalism, capitalism, capitalism's other? So if capitalism sees its end as its other and it's able to bank on it, it is being perfectly Hegelian. It has a determined other. But isn't life another life, something else than life as defined by capitalism, a, a different kind of other, um, something that does not enter under the uh, heading of the probable, something that does not answer to all the calculations of probability, which are absolutely essential to everything, including COVID, right? Uh, um, a lot of my friends were saying we're all becoming epidemiologists, and my sense is actually we're all becoming statisticians, right? Because we are all navigating numbers now. How many you know, how many this, how many that, how much that, how long for this. Uh, um, numbers are absolutely essential to, to, to the way we think. And, and the probable seems to have something to do with, with calculation as well. And so um, if you could say something about that, it may be one question rather than two, but um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, my view is that finance is the way that capitalism uh, makes itself resilient by weaponizing its own transiency. Uh, that is a perfect summary argument. And thus takes its end as something interior to its continuation, uh, which is my argument. And then you rightly ask, what is its outside? if its end is a part of its inside. Uh, <laughs> and I, 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 I think the beginning of an answer to your question, it, it gets to sort of the, 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 the moral philosophy side of my, my academic formation, is, is, is that optionality has become what life is <laughs> and what life is about. You know, when uh, I don't know whether uh, how many of you at Miser were, were there when I talked about online education. I remember uh, I was giving a lecture about that uh, uh, at Miser based on, on my political work in the US. And, and I described a lot of the online courses that are available to you places like Kampala as out of the money options to succeed in the US, <laughs> which have value even if you're not in the US and you want to get a job with an NGO refugee camp in Northern Uganda, uh, because it, 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 it allows you to, to, to calibrate and set your degree on par with a degree uh, that you might get from it wasn't calibrated to a US course and so on and so forth. I think the notion of life as being valuable, not because of actual exercisable opportunities, uh, not because of what you have, 
but because of how your choices might be affected by the volatility of your circumstances is a very specific, uh, uh, highly, uh, uh, highly structured uh, conception of the value of life which 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 uh, which relates to uh, to uh, all sorts of uh, development projects in in outside the US that have to do with capacity building and so on and so forth uh name you know you can be in a refugee camp and be building your 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 capacity to get a job and weren't stuck in the refugee camp which might have some value in the refugee camp in qualifying you for a creative writing program or something like that uh, which would improve your situation or at least distinguish you from other people. That notion, the notion of optionality that is the way in which and the value of optionality that is at a moral level, at the level of life, uh, the way capitalism imagines its end as being part of its perpetuation is is something that 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 can be attacked. I mean, it is a very, it is a very truncated, a very limiting conception of life uh, that that basically uh, uh, conditions life on its precarity. But because optionality is, the value of optionality increases the more precarious your life is. Now, that's not a full answer. But it's uh, uh, it does suggest that if 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 capitalism is to be succeeded by something that is not already its inside outside, it would be uh, it would be a world in which uh, value upon precarity of value. Bob, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask a question. Uh, consider that you have four discussants, okay? Discussant number three is Gil Anijar and, 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 and I'm discussant number four. Um, so I was struck by, uh, in, your, in your discussion of, uh, of the relationship between the analysis you're giving and those who seek to change the situation we find ourselves in. Um, you, you, you say that uh, uh, you, you, are, you see yourself as offering, as developing methods of analysis uh, that uh, oppositional people can use. Um, and I would like you to say more about this. Uh, the, the, the political side of it in the sense that you also talked of how your analysis points to the opposition that is needed, uh, the, the choke point around which uh, mobilization can be, can be created. So we get the opposition that is needed. And I would like you to relate this notion of the opposition that is needed to your uh, understanding of the opposition that exists. Uh, it, it would be because this week in the US, right? Uh, there are demonstrations which are spreading, right? Uh, there's an entire shift uh, in uh, the, first, the first phase of the Black Lives Matter agitation, which was some time ago. Uh, a response to it was all lives matter. Uh, and now, of course, it's very clear that all lives are not at risk. Uh, and, and, and the movement is back. Uh, now very much around black lives matter. That's the, that's the center point. That's the, uh, 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 and, and so it's not, not really around the bailout. Uh, it's it's about more, um, or maybe it's about bailout. It's about who needs to be bailed out, uh, and and mm -hmm. and certainly it's about historical justice. Uh, 
uh, absolutely. Uh, but it would be good to hear you sort of engage with the movement that exists rather than the movement that should be, or at least to build a link between the two. Well, I mean, it is absolutely the case that in order to bring about the level of compliance that is necessary unless and until there is a treatment and a government, the US government needs to be more legitimate than it is. And that it cannot be more legitimate than it is without addressing the relationship between democracy and the possibility or the option of historical justice. That is to say, the need of government for greater legitimacy makes the option of historical justice more valuable at precisely a moment when the government is saying everything's off the table because of the need to address the public health concerns of the virus. Transgressing the public health compliance requirements is a newly available means of protest in society uh, that may well lead to a spot. Uh, it also, as everyone possibility, that uh, defeating Donald Trump, for example, might have been easier uh, if he were simply incompetent on the public health crisis, then it might be if uh, he uh, can uh, create a reaction against the demand for greater justice in society. Uh, and uh, you know, those of us who remember 1968, as you and I do, uh, know very insofar as this looks like that, it's followed by reaction as well. So the question is how you think about turning this into something that is mobilizing. Here, you know, you ask what relationship this has to the bailout. Well, one of the things that we've seen is, is the things that were done to bail out the capital markets in research now, I don't have it available to me, uh, practically double what was done in 2008. Uh, and that the condition of doing that has been to bail out corporations and could be to support at public expense, at least for the duration. The, the question that needs to be addressed, and this is a question that uh, uh, 1968 that could be addressed now, uh, that wasn't available in 1968, is what constraints the stability of capitalism places on the kind of thing that's happening now. In, 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 in my view, what happened, and you can see this now, a complete disconnect between stability of asset markets and GDP. Everyone knows that GDP is going down the tubes, but it's not contagious because asset markets have not gone down the tubes. Uh, property values are still high. I just saw San Francisco Chronicle this morning that a closet is without, without, without plumbing is renting for uh, $1,500 a month uh, in San Francisco. The question of whether everything that is going now, going on now is, being, is, is going on contingent upon the capital markets confidence, but we'll put them first, is a critical question that couldn't be raised in 1968 because we didn't see it this way. We saw the economy and the stock market as, as, as tethered to G. I'm 
I'm afraid you've frozen. Uh, and then and then regard what it does to uh, uh, either suppress or 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 uh, uh, or, or 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 buy off uh, civil unrest as uh, as as as. as good consistent with prioritizing the protection of capital markets, now raises the question in a much more acute form of capitalism than was raised in 1968, namely what it means for capital markets to come first, and particularly what it means the value of accumulated wealth, or to put it back in terms of after evil, the ability of beneficiaries to keep their gains at the center of things. Uh, just yesterday, I was reading an online edition of the journal N Plus One, which uh, uh, I think is, is very good, uh, in my opinion, probably better than Jacobin. So why is it that why is it that protests in black neighborhoods get put down? Well, obviously, it's to protect whites. <laughs> it's because what happens when neighborhoods are destroying themselves? is that if they're not put down, there's a loss of confidence in the fact that, or the possibility that they could be put down, which is another way of thinking about what I call an after evil, the beneficiary question. Are the benefits of past injustice going to be allowed to persist? I think the stability of capital markets is, is, uh, is a way to have a laser focus on that issue. Uh, and it relates to what's going on now very directly because what's going on now can lead to the reaction that we saw in 68 unless we have a, a laser focus on the beneficiary question, which is my version of the class question. Thank you, Bob. Um, well, we are uh, we're coming to the, to the end of our uh, three hour uh, seminar. Um, we're taking a short uh, break from here on because our next seminar is, uh, uh, is on uh, June 19th, Friday, June 19th. Uh, that's uh, Professor Wang Wei uh, from uh, Xinhua University in, uh, in Beijing. Uh, we will be, Javi will be distributing the, uh, uh, the topic and the readings uh, in, uh, let's say, around uh, June, June 12th, by June 12th. We normally distribute these things a week before, so by June 12th, he'll be distributing it. Um, and we are at the same time uh, thinking through uh, the second phase of uh, uh, this global conversations uh, series, uh, and which means that we, we need to go through an assessment of uh, what we've had until now. Uh, if you would like to uh, send us, you know, your comments, please do. It would be great. Your suggestions. Uh, Bob said that uh, the last time he was at Miser, he. He gave a talk on online seminars and Africans taking online seminars as a way to find jobs in the US. Uh, well, who would have known that Miser would be offering online seminars uh, to, to, to people outside Africa and uh, with, uh, with Trump's uh, uh, decision not to, not to give uh, visas to, to students from China and maybe students from other places. Uh, we, Even professors we, at Columbia need to increase their portfolio, you know. It's, uh, I mean, you know, look, <laughs> we, are, we, we, are, we are open. We are now open to, 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 to radical changes. Uh, and and uh, uh, as they say, inshallah. So thank you very much. Thank uh, you for listening. It was thank good you, Bob. Thank you. Yeah. This was great. Yes. Okay. Uh, everybody, I'm going to press that magic button. It says end.
and we'll be we'll be back together again June 19th bye